I would like to, to thank everyone for, uh, for being here, uh, to, to take a look at a snapshot of the education and public outreach and engagement and communications activities that are taking, across, taking place across the facilities. And so the presenters that we have here uh, are from various facilities and various efforts and initiatives. And it's really interesting, I mean, when you start to take a look at all of the great things that are happening across uh, the NSF facilities, it's pretty darn impressive. And so what we wanted to do was to just try to give a snapshot uh, of those activities. So we have folks here in the room, we have a number of people online, uh, and we'll be working through, I believe, uh, seven uh, presentations. At 2 p.m., uh, Jim Matson is here, and we're going to uh, break away for uh, a live announcement uh, from some exciting news from Ice Cube. But I'm going to let Jim go ahead and, and fill everybody in on that. So we do want to get started. Uh, and do we have Yasmin's presentation? Okay, that's coming up. And Yasmin, if you can hear me, you are going to be first. And if you could do, when you're starting your presentation, if you can just do a quick introduction. I'm so-and-so, and I'm with so-and-so. And do something. What, you know. Can everyone hear me? Ah, uh, yes, we can hear you, Yasmin. Thank you. All right, okay. so you're on. Let's go. Yeah, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity for being here today and talk to you. My name is Yasmin Kadirteo. I am the Senior STEM Education Specialist at AUI, and I work with Tim Spock at the Department of Education and Public Engagement. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about all the initiatives that we have. Uh, there are many, so I'm going to try to do this fast. Hopefully, my pronunciation is good so you can understand. Um, Okay, so at AUI uh, EPE, our vision is to become a global leader when it comes to STEM and education and public engagement. And we also are in our mission, we want to engineer, we want to use the STEM and to engineer the world when it comes to education and public engagement. At AUI, we have four lines of work that you can see there, but we also have a special opportunities. All those ideas and great projects that are not directly aligned with each with the other four, but is still aligning with our vision and mission, then we will also consider to develop in the future. One of our projects is Big Astronomy. Big Astronomy is being funded by NSF and is a planetarium show that talks about the people that works on the observatories that enable science. When we talk about the observatories and professionals, we always think about astronomers, but there is more than that. There is a huge and uh, um, different type of professionals that all of them work together in order to do big discoveries and naval science. There is a website there, so you can go to the website and you can get the flat version of the show for free. And we have educational resources in English and Spanish. Another project is their Astronomy in Chile Educator Ambassador Program. This project has also been funded by NSF since 2015. And here we have we choose a different uh, professionals and individuals from the United States to go to Chile, to the North Chile, to the NSF observatories to learn how science is being made there. Then when everyone comes back to their hometown, to their communities, they have to do outreach activities and inform to the community why they, what they learned there. Uh, we have our next cohort traveling to Chile in August, uh, now in a month here. So uh, you can learn more about it in the website right there. Another project is Mission Patagonia. Mission Patagonia took the model out of ACAP. So now, instead of focus our work in astronomy, now we're doing it on ocean and sustainability sciences. Uh, this project, is, we started last year, and, and we had a group of eight individuals that went to the south of Chile around the Patagonia to learn about what is the science that is taking place there and how we can use our resources in order to work for a better sustainable world. Uh, we are planning for our next expedition. This, is, this expedition is going to take place in uh, November. So if you want to apply for it, and you can go to the website and learn more about it. Yes, I mean two minutes. Oh, um, we have experience in this other projects. It's uh, 
using robot telescopes and helping students to learn and engage more in, in science and uh, through telescope and astronomy. Um, a STEM podcast for students that have visual problems. This is a new initiative at the UI and we're using STEM to engage with a diverse community. Uh, you can go to the website. There is the Ocean Sounds that is already out. We have the Network for Air and Space Research, Education, and Innovation with Data. This is a project also being funded by NSF, and we had our Changing Planet Summit just a few weeks ago. And these projects bring different uh, professionals from different backgrounds uh, come together to see how we can all advance science and, and earth science and data science all together. Cosmovision of the Pacific, so projects come very from my heart. This is a, a meeting that will bring indigenous and non-indigenous together in a safe space to share what is shareable in order to advance together for a better future for all. We had our first meeting in Seattle this past January under the Lamination, and now we're working to uh, hold a new meeting that's going to bring 100 individuals, indigenous and non-indigenous, to come to the middle ground to walk the middle together. Uh, we were invited to submit an agro proposal to NSF, so we're waiting for for that and hopefully this this future meeting can take place in February uh, next year. Uh, big Science advanced this Big Science is a TV series that's talking about all the big, big facilities uh, and how they are inform the community to uh, learn more science and engage with more a uh, broader um, um, uh, population. Then the North American Regional Office of Astronomy for Development. This is uh, one of the offices that's out of the OED. Um, and we are exploring how you use astronomy for development, astronomy for developing educational, uh, economical, or, in, or even how you use astronomy to bring communities together, astronomy for diplomacy. Um, and we have a website there, so if you can look more and learn more about our office, that else is very, very excited. And the last project is the um, AstroXL. This is our last project that's been funded by NSF, and we are going to work globally, bringing many different networks across the all five continents to see how we can accelerate research development and education um, across the, the world. Okay, and thank you, Yasmin. <laughs> really appreciate that. And uh, we're going to jump right over to Lars and tell us about Noir Labs. Hi there, everyone. My name is Lars, and um, I work for NSF's NOAA Lab. Um, I'm head of the Communications, Education, and Engagement unit there. And I'll give you a very quick uh, overview of some of the things that we're doing at the moment. So um, just to remind you all what NSF's NOAA Lab is, it is everyone in the US's favorite lab for nighttime astronomy, optical astronomy. And we have these telescopes in Arizona, in Chile, and in Hawaii at the summits there. We have four summits in total. And on the horizon are these big 30-meter telescopes uh, that the uh, US is currently building and that we are working on getting involved with. So um, in our daily work, we support all the ongoing activities of the observatories on the data side, on the actually operational side. This image is quite important and profound to us because this is the first recoding of the Gemini North mirror in many, many years. And it was after a prolonged pause due to a mishap that happened operationally. So when this mirror was coded and put back in the telescope, everyone side. Uh, <laughs> of relief because it was a big six months uh, break in taking data on the uh, on the site and this is the first image that we helped put together showing as everyone can probably recognize in astronomy Michi 101 the beautiful galaxy with the supernova in the lower um, left corner there of other notable news is, of course, the jewel in the crown here, which is Rubin, Vera C. Rubin Observatory, which is being finished on Sarah Pachon, an amazing project to do um, time-based astronomy every night, taking a considerable chunk of the southern sky and comparing with previous nights and showing millions and millions of differences called alerts hopefully leading to new and profound discoveries in astronomy. And 
This amazing project is right next to Gemini South and SOAR on the summit there. This is a picture of the inside. We support visits. And just this week, we're back at the main summits with our public visits. It has taken long to uh, put together, but that's also something we're really happy and proud about. Another example of what we do is working with the scientists on citizen science projects. This is a new one that was just launched called Cool Neighbors. They are inviting everyone to look for these brown dwarfs, which are almost stars, but not quite. They're also not planets, so they're very faint. And the idea is to look for them in the solar neighborhood. So just within the next few light years around the sun, and they can give really interesting physics uh, insights to stars and planets. This is another example. We just recently um, helped release the first few percent of the data for the dark energy spectroscopic instrument, which is an amazing um, new project. It's been underway for many, many decades now, and it's now taking data at uh, Kid Peak. The survey is actually pretty well advanced, almost half done, but the first data are now out with the scientific community and will lead to big discoveries. And of course, discoveries, press releases is what we do for a living in the EPO area, along with the local engagement. This is an example of a gamma ray burst in a distant galaxy which also gave the scientists some new insights in how these things take place by coalescing uh, stellar remnants, white dwarfs, or neutron stars. But to skip to something completely different, this is how we are working on implementing the community-based science model. Those of you who are in astronomy will remember that in the 2020 decadal report, which came out in 2021 um, because of the pandemic, there is this um, incredibly important concept of a community-based science model. It is a sincere, truthful, two-way engagement with the communities that we work in, in a new and, and sustainable mode of engagement. So we're talking about respect and reciprocity, trust and integrity. These are values that were stated in the Decadal Report. And we need to do better with the stewardship of our sites. We need to do better ultimately with our planet. Um, we want to think global, but act local and be sustainable and accountable and protect the sites that we're in. And this is being taken very, very seriously now after the decadal. So I'm happy to say that we have a, a plan that we are working on as an organization. We're very um, uniquely situated to make an impact and serve as a template for the implementation uh, of this. Astronomy is always a very visual science and it can be really a kind of gateway science for STEM and for students. Um, the work is led by our indigenous staff and that's really important. Um, they work together with us with the diversity, uh, equity and inclusion staff and special stakeholders. <clears throat> you can imagine the directors, for instance, Gemini North has a specific stake in these issues. Gemini North is on Mount Akea, which is a very profoundly important site to the local communities. And of course, they are leading a good, a good part of, of all this work. We focus uh, on each of the sites. We also focus on getting the individual facilities, whether that's Gemini North or Ruben, known in the local uh, communities. And then we try to empower staff to engage with the local communities to be out there in comfortable circumstances. Uh, at the end, I wanted to just um, mention another planetarium show um, that we have worked together with partners on the 30 meter telescope in Milo and Hawaii. It's called One Sky. It focuses on diverse cultural and indigenous astronomy and um, really demonstrates how One Sky connects us all. And um, the distribution is very equitable. It's online, one click, and people can literally download whether you're a big or a small community planetarium. Um, and we feel this is a way to really uh, give access and uh, let everyone take part uh, in this big 
adventure and we've received praise from the community for doing this and it is going quite well and I'm happy to announce that together with Tim and or our AUI we will do the same for big astronomy uh, during the closeout here in July and August so thank you thank you Lars excellent stuff uh, and so uh, we're going to keep our keeping ourselves on track and want to go over to Becca and Becca before you press any buttons wait till your presentation comes up please okay Becca Hi there, my name is Becca Hathaway, and I'm with the UCAR Center for Science Education, which is part of the same organization, UCAR, that includes the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR. And I'm talking about some of the work we do in our group to reach um, K-12 and general public audiences in a hybrid world, and really looking at um, where we've landed on a sustainable model um, coming out of the pandemic, where we've built up some virtual presence, but now can also do things in person. And so how to do that with a small education team and still reach um, broad audiences. Uh, so my group, the UCAR Center for Science Education, um, wants to engage all learners to explore and understand our changing world. We focus on earth system science and atmospheric and related sciences. In addition to some of the work I'll be talking about with programs that are directly reaching um, students in the general public, we have lots of online resources that are free and available to teachers and the public. Um, the stuff that's scrolling on the left side of the screen shows a lot of our resources that are available as free downloads or to use online. We also have a new website that came out in the last year called Sky Sci for Kids. Um, that uses these fun cartoon characters, and it's a, it's a kid-focused site for, uh, for kids ages 5 through 10 that doesn't need to be facilitated by adults. So there are games and videos and things kids can do on their own independently that are age-appropriate and fun and engaging. So just want to encourage you to share that with teachers and parents. So um, when the pandemic hit, we went from this world where we were reaching people in person at the NCAR Mesa Lab in Boulder, um, groups of adult um, general public visitors or special interest groups, um, foreign dignitaries or other um, VIPs, groups of kids. So we went from that world to this with our team trying to figure out how to do virtual things, um, setting up demonstrations in their backyards and in their basements, um, figuring out how to use um, different kinds of video equipment. And then we were able to take the opportunity while we were closed, which actually ended up being quite a long time. We didn't reopen to the public until November, the end of November um, 2022. So it was quite a long pause. Um, but during that time, we were able to do some research, learn what teachers were interested in, what was working for them in um, hybrid and virtual education. Um, getting some training and figuring out best practices. We hired somebody who has expertise in virtual programming, and we um, identified a part of our storage area in the basement of our building that we could build a green screen studio in so that once our team could go back on site, the same people could be doing both virtual programs and in-person programs. We don't do hybrid programs generally. Most of our programs are one or the other, So, but this allows people to be in the same building and do both things in the same day. And then once we got the go-ahead to reopen, we um, pulled together a team to do a big push to finalize a bunch of stuff we'd been working on. We did a lot of website improvements, um, updated accessibility information for visitors. We've had a lot of accessibility initiatives going on that we wanted to um, highlight, like the thing on the right. We created a sensory guide that gives people kind of color cues of where they're going to be higher sensory experiences so that for visitors and kids who um, who have a hard time with that, they can avoid interacting with certain things. We also have a guide on when the building's busy and when it's quieter to give people kind of tips on what are good times to visit. Um, we updated signage. You know, some of it had to do with sort of public health and safety stuff coming out of the pandemic, but also just other wayfinding and things. It was just an opportunity to improve things. And also while the building was closed, we kept working and did a whole bunch of exhibit upgrades. And then we did a phased reopening. Like I said, we opened right after Thanksgiving at, in 2022. Prior to that, we did some limited field trips and limited public tours where the doors were locked, but we were able to bring in um, certain smaller group sizes. That got some new staff that we were hired, some training to start doing programs. 
And then once we fully, we were, the doors were open to anybody coming in, we did limited field trips just to kind of phase our team into doing the different kinds of work, regular public tours, and then we were just open so people could come in the door. And then stage three, which was starting about in February, um, we're fully open, full field trips, public tours, and visitor centers open. And during all of this, we've also been doing virtual programs as well. So this shows like some of the same people um, doing all different kinds of programming in one day. So um, we have a schedule where we're doing field trips four days of the week. We're doing public tours six days of the week, and we're doing virtual programs um, five, the five weekdays every week. Here's a little snapshot of our attendance. The last full school year that we had before the pandemic was the 2018 to 19 school year. So you can see our in-person field trip programs were a little over 50%. The tours were about 40%. And then we have a big public science event that was a little under 10%. And then you can see this is a um, this is the last year, but an incomplete year where we went completely open. So this coming year will be like our best opportunity to see the real comparison. But you can see the way that virtual has mixed in to the different things, the different ways we're reaching people. I'm actually gonna go back real quick to say, because something I didn't say that's kind of obvious that you all are probably experiencing as well, that we love being open in person and reaching our local audience. We're also a tourist destination for people that come to Colorado. Um, but obviously doing virtual programming has allowed us to reach people in all of the states. We're getting into lots of different countries. We have some schools in Mexico that are coming regularly to virtual programs. Kids in India and Italy and just all over the place are finding, we're making connections. And so it's a wonderful way to broaden our reach and be more accessible to people from all over the place who can't necessarily travel. So what's next? Um, we are continuing to work on some accessibility resources. We're working on some visual schedules and um, sensory tours for um, low vision visitors. Um, we're bringing back our popular in-person public science event called Super Science Saturday this coming November. Um, we'll have our first school year coming up where we have a full year being open and we'll see how our team does that to make sure we're doing a sustainable schedule for everybody so that they don't get burned out, but can try to reach all of these different people in different ways. And we're also updating an exhibit you can see in that photo in the bottom left, it's our Sun Earth Connections exhibit that was installed in 2010. So it's an opportunity to refresh and update it and make it more engaging. And that's it. Thank you for your time. All right, Becca, thank you. You must have practiced that. Perfect, on the dot, <laughs> seven minutes. Okay, Caroline, uh, we'll wait for your... Uh, I got, I got it. Okay. okay, Caroline, you're on. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Caroline McNeil, and I work in the public affairs department at the National Mag Lab. Uh, we're a user facility where people come from all over the world to uh, put cool things in our magnets from new materials uh, that we study diseases and um, look at uh, environmental impacts on asphalt and plastics and all kinds of interesting things. And um, I picked three things that we're excited about that we've done this year just to fill you in on what we've been doing. One of the biggest things in the public affairs team portfolio is Open House. Um, and it's an event that has slowly grown as the lab has grown over the last 20 years. And it's a giant science festival, free for all. Um, people come to tour the lab, do hands-on activities and uh, talk to our scientists. And this past year was our return to in-person open house. And we had a, over 11,000 people through the doors in a couple of hours. It's bonkers. And um, our very small team is able to do that through powerful partnerships. We uh, mobilize our entire staff. We have um, all of our scientists sort of pick their own activities, display their own spaces. They have a lot of ownership in what happens there. But we also invite uh, other organizations from the community. We have the Astronomical Society come, we have a marine lab come, and it really helps fill out the event. Um, and it makes it so that we can have that many people. Because if we were all on our own, I don't think we'd be able to pull that much off. Um, so one of the strategies and like the theme for my little talk is that uh, we always are looking for partners on the outside to help amplify our small team. We wanted to take that open house energy 
and uh, do it more often. Open house happens once a year. And one of the things that uh, the biggest complaints we have about it is that people want more of it. Um, it's so much work and it takes maybe a little extra nudging to get our scientists to do just that one day um, so that we uh, knew that it wasn't really possible to do that twice a year. So we took over science nights and we've partnered with our local library system um, to put out a monthly event that has sort of that same science fun energy. It's for young kids, but the parents seem to have just as much fun. And we really tapped into an existing event structure that our library is so good at doing. Um, and they let us come in and bring our own special sauce. Our team, the sort of playbook for uh, Science Night is uh, designed to make it really easy for our scientists to jump in at the last minute and be the stars of the show. I don't know if um, in your world you feel like sometimes it's hard to get the attention of our researchers that we work with because they're very busy and uh, it's a huge burden on them to keep up with all of their regular things. And so sometimes when you try to have uh, pull them into the education space, it can feel a little difficult. So how we design this event, it lasts about an hour on a Thursday, random Thursday afternoon, once a month. Uh, we picked the theme and we picked a storybook that was science uh, related on the theme. And our scientists just read the book. They show up and then they teach through the, the storybook and then they relate that book to their research. And then we break into hands-on activities and it's been a really nice balance of um, sort of fun, chaotic science energy that elementary school students love, plus um, linking that back to the basic research that happens at the lab, because sometimes that can be a really long walk, right? Like you're an elementary school student and you want to teach about what's happening at high level physics. How do we get there? Um, so hands-on plus a storybook, plus some just very humanizing moments. Um, one of the things we always do when we break into activities is have an ask a scientist table. Um, and you can see some of that happening in the photos. Uh, we let the students just come up and chat with our scientists. They love it. They think our scientists are rock stars. I always have a little box of questions in case you don't have a question of your own. You can just pull one out and be like, what was your favorite Halloween costume growing up? Just to have a, a real connection with our researchers. And it's been really successful. We've had about 60 to 90 people show up on a random weeknight. We never know how many people are going to come. So um, it's pretty chaotic and awesome. Um, but it's been a really good way of building goodwill with our community and having access points for young kids. And the last project I wanted to focus was very different. Um, the, the last two, Science Night and Open House, are really focused on our local community. But we have a big story to tell and lots of audiences to reach. Um, so this year, we were super excited to make a video with uh, the YouTube channel Veritasium. We knew when they reached out that it was more than our average media request. And uh, so we pulled out the big guns, literally. Tim Murphy's a very strong guy. Um, mm -hmm. And he's uh, the director of our DC field facility. And he worked with us and directly with Veritasium to figure out what awesome things can we do on these instruments. And it took a lot of string pulling to get magnet time, um, the use of our instruments, is really prized by researchers and to carve out a little bit of time where we could do something that really wasn't research at all, it's all outreach, um, was a really special thing. And so they fired up the world's strongest magnet. And uh, I think right now the video has a little over 9 million views. So if anybody wants to watch it a few times and help us get to 10, that would be great. <laughs> uh, but um, it's been a great way of telling our core story. They did a really good job of just explaining, I think so many people start out as like, what do you mean by magnets, right? Like they start at their refrigerator when we're talking about magnets. And this video, I think really reached a science interested adult audience that we wouldn't have gotten on our own. One of the things that I think is so exciting about partnering with outside groups is that they can help us break out of our institutional voice that can feel so limiting. Some of the footage they used we had filmed and put on our YouTube page, but because we're an institution, we're not gonna drive that same level of audience. And uh, so they used our footage and got it out to the masses and it was awesome.
Okay, thank you, Caroline. Uh, great, and we're gonna uh, go to Evie, who is going to be virtual. I'm Evie McCumber. I am one of the new educators at NCAR's um, newer education engagement and early career development group. Um, we have four different sections. We have future workforce. Um, we have early career development where we are offering professional development opportunities for early career scientists. We have university partnerships where we work with the REU network, um, MSIs, and we bring forth the innovator program where we have um, convergent science being happening. And we have all those divisions, but I'm here to represent the engagement division. Um, we have about four major projects. We do a lot of work with multimedia and creating um, engaging videos for all of our audiences. We support the Traveling Climate Exhibit um, in conjunction with Syed. Um, but the two projects that I will be talking to you all about are going to be our field campaigns and how we support that type of science, as well as our public lecture series. Um, starting with field campaigns, one of the things that we want to make sure that we are not doing is parachute science, in which we just go in, have the field campaigns, the scientists do the science, and then they just leave the population and no one knows what was happening there. So with um, support from the PIs, we try to come up with alternatives that will engage the audiences, whether it be instrumentation up in houses, K-12 and university classroom visits, having students come into the field and do the science. We create teacher curriculum. Um, we tend to also collaborate with um, specialists in curriculum for that, just to make sure that we are meeting standards wherever we go. Um, we create videos as well as educational handouts. Um, here we have a video. I am not gonna play all of it since I have about four and a half minutes, um, but I'll start it from here. Hola. ¿Todos bien? Sí. As part of our project, we did outreach activities. The first was to host a short course at the University of Costa Rica on NCAR's community hydrological model. Costa Rica has a lot of hydropower and this type of model is of great interest to them. And then the students, of course, it's of great value for future water managers or uh, students studying the hydrometeorology in Costa Rica. La visita a las escuelas de primaria, principalmente en una zona alejada, es muy importante. Tienen muy, un acceso muy limitado al arte, por ejemplo, a la ciencia, a la ingeniería. Entonces, que otro lleve lo que se está haciendo con toda la tecnología, los instrumentos de medición, la ciencia, a la escuela, le provee a los niños perspectiva. Y la perspectiva lo que hace es crecer su mente. En Nuki, that's a very isolated place, and there was only one school. We wanted to make sure that the people in the town understand the, the activity. And we managed to reach out to at least 200 students. They participate in launching the balloon. They ask questions about the type of observations we are gathering and why. Triggering inside those kids the idea of observing the environment was very key for us. El objetivo principal del Open House es interactuar con ellos, los investigadores, con los estudiantes de eh, universidad o de secundaria y poderles contarles qué hacemos, qué es el proyecto OTREC y cuál es el, nuestro objetivo y responder todas las inquietudes que ellos tienen. Ellos pueden subir al avión, pueden ver los instrumentos. Lo que más me interesa es ver lo que la ciencia se ve desde una Costa Rican perspectiva. They have very different weather, they have different concerns about the natural environment that they're in. And it's fun to see how this plays out with the general public. Come um, for this upcoming year, we will be collaborating on three different field campaigns about the solar eclipse. Um, and we will also be working on another field campaign um, in the Arctic region. Um, trying to create and just make sure that we are supporting the community as they receive their scientists. But the main project that I work on for engagement is going to be um, our Explorer series, where we are trying to bring 
where class science directly to the public, we have three kinds. Conversations are going to be more informal um, panels in which you have a group of experts discussing a topic and lectures. But regardless of what it is that we have, we always start the same way. We start with a word cloud in which we are trying to get the audience to think about what they're going to see, to have them get into what is the overarching topic that will be discussed. From there, depending on what we have, we address that and move on. For conversations, they're all going to be fully virtual. Um, it's one-on-one, -on -one, a scientist and I. Um, we try to make sure that we script that in order to make sure that it flows as well and that we support our scientists um, and not allow for any dead space or dead time. Um, as I said, panels, we have our first one coming up on August 2nd about evacuation and the social science aspect of when we um, talk about evacuation, specifically in Colorado, since we have had so many wildfires um, and we have had to go ahead and evacuate as well. Um, we finally came in person for our first hybrid event, which is our lectures. This was our first in-person lecture since 2019, in which we discussed um, ensemble data predictions, which is a very interesting topic to Coloradans because the weather does whatever the weather wants in a day. It can start sunny and end up snowing. So with ensemble data predictions, we were able to bring forth like why is forecasting so difficult? When we work with the Explorer series- and Evie, we're working, 30 seconds. Okay. With scientists, we try to make sure that um, we also reach our Spanish-speaking population as well. Um, and we have created a few Spanish conversations as well. Um, we have best practices. We support our scientists design and talk from like their abstract and their slides. We create their questions. We use the feedback from surveys to build our new series. We make sure that wherever you're coming from, you have access to the talk. We check our attendance to see what events are um, attended well and not, and then we are creating a whole evaluation on our Explorer Series event. Okay, so thank you, Evie, and we are gonna we're gonna uh, squeeze in here our, our last presentation before we uh, go to Jim and the uh, Ice Cube discovery. Uh, so let's go with Evan and Tashana uh, if you two can present. Hi everyone, um, I'm Evan Pasquale, Communication Specialist, joined here today with Deshauna Ben, our Education Specialist, and we're half of the Education Public Outreach Team from the National Solar Observatory. Today we're going to go through some of the exciting updates and things, programs we have going on. Uh, like I said, we are a small but mighty team. Uh, we have recently have a new director who was appointed about three weeks ago. Um, there's Deshauna and I, and John Williams does all of our webmaster graphic design. So for those who might not be familiar with the NSO, um, we operate ground-based solar telescopes around the world. There are two main programs. Uh, the Daniel K. Noe Solar Telescope, commonly referred to as DKIS, is one of the NSF flagship facilities for ground-based solar astronomy. Um, sometimes it's dubbed the solar microscope because we are producing the highest resolution detailed images of the sun ever taken. Um, we are based in Maui, Hawaii on the summit of Haleakala and we began operations in 2022. The second program is the NIST program. Uh, we have multiple sites around the world. We've been collecting data for over 25 years and we take full disk images of the sun. And so as my job as a communicator as for the EPO team, uh, we tell stories of science, technology, people, and community. And so this is a visual snapshot of the content that we put out. Uh, solar image releases, um, stories about the instruments and technology at DKIS, the people that work at the NSO who make science and engineering possible, and then um, stories of us taking this out into the community and doing community engagement. This is all done through press releases, blogs, social media, and other multimedia content. This is all done uh, to connect with local and global audiences. And so while the science is really known around the world, it's our job to connect with the communities in which we operate and serve in. And this is all done to foster inspiration and wonder through storytelling. So this is a really great visual snapshot of the local newspaper here on Maui that again touches on those themes of um, science, technology, and people. We recently had a image release from the first cycle of observations taken at DKIST. Um, and so as the solar cycle is nearing its peak, 
the demand and interest in these sun images are high. And so these are eight images of sunspots in quiet regions that we released um, via press release. And we had gained a ton of earned media, um, digital, print, broadcast with, uh, we gained about over 500 million in potential reach. Another um, area that we're working in is jumpstarting site visits and tours of the facility. Because we are in our first year of operations, there are some limitations. Uh, we need to learn how to crawl before we walk, so to speak. Um, but so far, we've hosted uh, tours for NSF and Aura leadership, um, dignitaries from Hawaii government. Uh, Sky and Telescope Magazine had a group tour that came through recently. And all of this is really to lay the foundation to expand tours to the general public, school groups, and media tours. With that, I'll hand it over to Tishana. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us. I'm Tishana. Um, Evan and I are based out here in Hawaii, and so that's where most of our education and public outreach efforts take place. Uh, but the first thing I'm going to talk about is, so like Evan mentioned, we are a small but mighty team, and so we're especially fortunate to have uh, partnerships, uh, relationships we've built with um, organizations in the community that are like-minded. And the one that I'm going to highlight today is with the Haleakala National Park. So we're actually their neighbors up on Haleakala. You can very clearly see our telescope from their summit um, observation deck. And we've been working with them to get different uh, edu updated educational um, things like plaques uh, that the visitors can learn more about our observatories with. Uh, but on the, on the top of that, we have this event called Solar Fest, and it happens once a year. And basically, we get together, share um, our love of the sun from both ends, the science end, and then, I mean, the astronomy end, and then also on the environmental side of things. Uh, but we have activity tables, we have science talks, and we have <coughs> amateur telescopes for uh, safe solar viewing. Uh, you can go next slide, Evan. As far as education programs, we have two main ones, um, Journey Through the Universe Maui and Journey to the Sun. The big difference is one is uh, directed towards students and the other is more of a professional development for educators. Um, next slide, Evan. Thank you. So starting with Journey Through the Universe, um, unlike the program on the Big Island, which was brought over by Gemini Observatory and Laura Lab. That program has been running very successfully, has a really well-respected reputation in the community. And that's been going for over 20 years now. The program on Maui is relatively new. We started in 2020 and the Maui program is led by us at NSO. Um, and then we work in collaboration with other Haleakala laboratories. Uh, but essentially we visit K through 12 classrooms, offer career panels and do STEM activities. Can you go to the next slide, Evan? Thank you. Uh, Journey to the Sun is our professional development. Uh, we work with local public school teachers and other STEM educators. Started in 2018, we're very fortunate to have a donation from the musician Sting. And so we were able to donate solar telescopes for Maui County Middle Schools. And then following the donation, we've uh, kept up with them and we offer a follow-up uh, workshop for them and whoever else might be interested where we give them, um, you know, an inside look at solar astronomy as an industry and different topics relevant to what the students are learning. And then we brainstorm on how they can bring that into the classroom. And then our last slide, please. Yep. Um, and then the last thing I'll talk about is uh, we try our best to participate in a lot of the different community programs offered. Uh, by STEM organizations. And so a few examples are just Girl Scouts. We do Astro Day, which is a program of the Institute for Astronomy. Things like Geek Meet, which is almost like a Comic-Con, but for tech enthusiasts, um, things like that. And really it's a, it's a nice way uh, that we can hit diverse audiences. So family friends, girls interested in STEM, uh, science folks, things like that, um, without having to do the planning ourselves. So it's a nice, a nice way to get in there and build community. And I think that's it. Okay, thanks, Evan and Tashana. Uh, we're gonna jump right into the uh, Ice Cube uh, broadcast that is uh, uh, actually happening right now and turn it over to Jim for commentary or additional explanation. 
Laboratory for more than 20 years now. Today, my colleagues contribute here in the um, ice cube data analysis, uh, specifically through state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms developed as part of this collaboration. Nowadays, many people are afraid of AI and some even claim that AI should be stopped. Actually, I'm not afraid of AI, I'm only afraid of stupid AI. And um, the current result sort of confirms this attitude, at least to a certain extent. Clever machine learning can give us many new and exciting results. And today we celebrate uh, one of these results. So congratulations on this excellent research, which we will learn more about in a, in a minute. Um, and good luck in your future endeavors. I hope that we have an inspiring evening and then I'm, e I'm even sure that we will have an inspiring evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So now we will begin a set of presentations describing the result. And uh, the first presentation will be by Anako Kurohashi Nilsson at Drexel University. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we will begin a set of presentations. Did I go on? Is that okay? Okay. Hello. Um, on behalf of the Ice Cube Collaboration, we'd like to announce the first observation of the galactic plane in high energy neutrinos at a significance of 4.5 sigma. Today we'll present evidence of this, but first let me explain what this means. So, Sorry, the feed is, okay, here we go. So, um, this is a picture at the geographic South Pole where our detector is. The building you see here houses many computers for ice cube. The detector itself is buried under the ice. It's a nighttime photo at the South Pole and you see this beautiful feature in the sky of the Milky Way. Because this is the South Pole, you see a uh, light green haze, and that's the aurora australis, or southern lights. You don't have to be at the South Pole to see the Milky Way. And in fact, for millennia, we have studied the Milky Way. Helen wrote about it. There can, you can fill a history book full of Milky Way observations. It is a largest feature in the sky and well studied. But today, we see it for the first time in something other than a wavelength in light. So the Milky Way is our galaxy. It is a spiral galaxy, and our sun, which we orbit around, is on one of the spirals. If you see it from top down, that's what it looks like. But from edge on, it's flat, so it's like a pancake or a disk. So if you're in the middle of the pancake or disk, looking towards the galactic center, then you would see something like an edge-on disk in the sky. And that is our view of the Milky Way, is the galactic plane. If you take a panel of the Milky Way and center it at the galactic center, um, this is the panel you see that describes the Milky Way. In recent decades, we have studied the Milky Way in not just optical light, or our eyes work, um, but we have seen it in many different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum, from radio waves to gamma rays. We have observed the Milky Way using more than just our eyes. And this iconic picture is the multi-wavelength view of our own galaxy. Today, for the first time, we had another image in high-energy neutrinos. This blurry image represents the first time we've seen our own galaxy in something other than electromagnetic radiation. 
This is an iconic image, as I said. If you're from the Department of Physics or Astronomy, we've seen some version of this poster somewhere in our departments. And because this is our galaxy seen in many different wavelengths, um, we're very familiar with this poster. And today we add a whole new panel, not just in energies, but in particles. So what are neutrinos? Neutrinos is an elementary particle. So you, this desk, the air, everything is made up of molecules. The molecules are made up of electrons in the nucleus. And as far as we know, the electrons aren't made up of anything. The electrons are an elementary particle. The nucleus is made up of neutrons and protons, which are made up of quarks. And as far as we know, quarks aren't made up of anything. So quarks are elementary particles. Neutrinos are also elementary particles. We think they're not made up of anything. They are what they are. However, neutrinos are not part of what make up you, me, the air, the table, everything around us that we can touch. It is a particle that's emitted if when the nucleus breaks, such as in nuclear fusion or fission. Neutrinos are a lot like light. They are neutral particles, as in electromagnetically uncharged, and they're nearly massless. However, unlike light, they seldom interact. So if I have a flashlight and I try to shine it across a board um, or a metal plate, you would not see the light come out on the other end. That's because the light interacts with the board. If I had a neutrino flashlight, which I wish I did, um, the neutrinos will stream through because they don't interact, they will stream through and you will see the neutrinos on the other side of the board. And in this way, we hope to see neutrinos spring out of deeper and denser parts of space. And we hope that neutrinos become a messenger in astronomy where we see different views of space. Let me take a step back and go through the history of what enabled this announcement today. So over four decades ago, a neutrino telescope was envisioned in ICE. Amanda, the predecessor experiment to IceCube, was completed in 2000. In 2011, we completed the IceCube detector. The IceCube detector, as I mentioned before, is at the geographic south pole. So the IceCube laboratory, this picture you saw with the Milky Way is pictured there. When you're standing there, you're standing on top of 2.5 kilometers of glacier ice. It is very high altitude at the South Pole. It's like eight minutes. We have found a way to drill 86 holes in the ice all the way down and leave more than 5,000 digital optical modules, DOMs, or light sensors in the ice. This way, we have light sensors scattered over cubic kilometer of ice. When you're buried in 2.5 kilometers of ice, you don't see any light, it's pitch black. Until you see a high energy particle zip through. This is real data from the IceCube collaboration. And you can see, let me play that again. You can see as a high energy particle enters, maybe, oh, sorry does not work. But when you see a trail of light, um, that's because of Cherenkov radiation of a high energy particle. Oh, here we go. And in this way, um, we collect high energy particles in our detector. IceCube is a collaborative effort. As you heard, it's very international. We have more than 350 scientists from 58 institutions in 14 countries around the world. Um, this is one of our collaboration photos. So when we um, meet twice a year, we take a collaboration meeting photo. Um, this is a recent one. Some of us travel to the South Pole. You can find me in the picture if you squint. And this is a real technological feat as well. If you think about 2.5 kilometers or 1.5 miles from where you're sitting now. Think of how far that reaches. We've dug that far down. So it's not just a particle physics experiment, it's a technological feat. Two years after we completed a detector, we found high energy astrophysical neutrinos for the first time from space. We always thought they would come from space, um, but it took two years after detector completion to find it. 
I was actually tasked to figure out if these neutrinos localized to something in the sky to trace back to where they're from to see what their sources are. And back in 2013, we couldn't definitively say what created them. Since then, we've identified two galaxies that emit neutrinos in 2018 and 2022. Today, we're talking about our third source, our own galaxy. And to tell us um, what this means and how we did it, I'm extremely proud to introduce um, Steve Scofani, my former PhD student. Okay, we're going to stop there. And Jim, if you have any final comments, uh, since we are at the end of our time. Um, so first, I want to compliment the, the, the other panelists because uh, th those talks were fantastic. And uh, I always learn more than I feel I contribute. Um, I, I, I want to provide just a little context for this, this announcement. You know, um, about 1895, uh, radioactivity was discovered, right? And um, about uh, 10 years later, it was discovered that there was energy missing when they looked at that. And then it took another 20 years after that before this radical idea was proposed in 1930 that maybe the missing energy was being carried away in a missing particle that couldn't be detected called the neutrino. It took another 25 years after that to come up with an experiment to show that these neutrinos were real, right, and could be detected. That was in 1955. And then about five years after that, it was proposed that if these neutrinos, right, were real, they should also be a cosmic messenger that could be um, used to explore the universe. But it would take the biggest telescope ever constructed. The neutrinos are the most common particle in the universe besides light particles, photons, but almost never interact. So even in 1960, in the first paper, they said, to take a detector that was one kilometer by one kilometer by one kilometer. And so for the next uh, literally 40 years, people tried to come up with ways to build those. And it had to be in a clear medium so everyone was working in the water. And Francis Halsen at UW-Madison in 1987 proposed that, you know, this crazy idea that maybe it'd be easier to work at the South Pole and build it in the ice. And in fact, um, it was. And we have the only cubic kilometer detector that's ever been built. And uh, so that took, <clears throat> um, to get the funding and actually build it, that took another decade. Um, and so the instrument's been fully running since about 2011. And then another uh, about six or seven years after that to see the first source of neutrinos, which was actually almost 4 billion light years away. Last fall, we, we discovered the second source where these neutrinos are originating from, uh, this galaxy called NGC 1068, which is about 40 million light years away. So the very strange thing about neutrinos in our galaxy is even though we're embedded in it, right, we did not, we couldn't see our galaxy with neutrinos without a huge amount of work. Um, these other galaxies were brighter than that. And so that's very um, perplexing, right? Because mostly um, the closer you are to something, right, the brighter it is. So the the galactic plane dominates basically all other wavelengths. And so this was not um, surprising that we would eventually see neutrinos, but what's surprising is actually how few there are, right? And so that's gonna be important in trying to understand where these extremely high energy particles originate from, what makes our galaxy different from these other galaxies that are brighter. Um, and so that's really our goal, is to um, understand the high energy universe. And uh, this is a unique probe in order to do that. 
Okay, thanks, Jim. And I, I wanna thank uh, the rest of our, our panelists here, both those that are uh, here in person and those that uh, contributed virtually. I know that we are, you're supposed to be in break and, and so we appreciate you hanging out here and sticking with us as, as we get through the, uh, these presentations. I apologize for not having time for, for Q&A, but of course uh, we do have Jim and Carolyn and Becca and Lars here. Uh, if you do have questions about any of their efforts or initiatives, they are more than happy to, to chat with you uh, 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 during break here. Uh, in this room, uh, I guess the next presentation, which will be at 2.30, is going to be on the uh, uh, branding, uh, new uh, NSF branding uh, uh, guidelines. And then we will have a session this afternoon, uh, I believe at 3.45, that is focused on collaboration in education, communications, outreach, engagement across the, the NSF funded facilities. And you're welcome to participate in, in, in that as, as well. We encourage you to do that as a matter of fact, because there are some great opportunities for that we can, I think, work together on. And uh, so looking forward to having you participate in that as well. So thanks again. You have time to grab a coffee before getting back in here for the, uh, the OPA presentation. Thanks again.